Well, we continue our series talking about calling, and one of the things that we've realized as we've walked through this, we went through uh, the Old Testament where God calls Abraham, Abraham, and then Jacob, Jacob, and then Moses, Moses, and then Samuel, Samuel, and, and now we're, we're, we're going into the, the New Testament where God calls someone's name twice, and as we talked about calling, one of the things we've realized is that every one of us has a calling upon our lives. God designed you and made you for a reason. Many people um, come to faith in Jesus. They place their faith. They say a prayer. They go to vacation Bible school. They go to camp or they grow up in church and they learn and understand about that Jesus saved them and, and, and they're grateful. And so they turn their life over to God. They say, I want to follow you. And then they start going to church and then they get in a Bible study or a small group of people and then, you know, they do some good stuff. Um, but what happens is they don't ever really zero in on their calling. They just believe that's what happens to like Billy Graham and a couple other people. But for the rest of us, we just kind of, we say the prayer, we get a study, and we go to, go to church and we sing the songs. But the truth is, God created you, designed you, gave you gifts, and has a calling upon your life. And most of us quietly go through life with ever, without ever discovering our calling. And one of the reasons is we get distracted. Several years ago, I'm having breakfast with one of the guys that was working on our staff at the time, and he was struggling, and it became apparent that he was struggling because I kept hearing stories. And so I said, you know what, I'm going to take him to uh, breakfast. So we go to breakfast. And I'm thinking, you know what, I'm just going to love on him, take him to breakfast, we'll talk through it. I'm thinking this is a good idea. I wish I had scheduled it in my office because we're in a public place having breakfast and I'm just saying, hey, you know, I, I've heard a couple of things where, um, you know, just some relational tension, some frustrations and, and some, a little bit of friction. And I just want to talk to you about that and, and, you know, maybe just the opportunity for us to, to reconcile some relationships and, and grow through this. I've got my kid gloves on. I'm being real soft and gracious. And face turns red, pushes back, and says, why can't everybody just let me do my job? I'm like, okay, and people are looking. It was loud. I'm like, okay, this is not going like I had planned. And I said, well, wh what do you mean? S since I've gotten here, the bar has been raised. We're doing this with excellence. We're doing this better than we've ever done it before, and no one's doing, we're doing this, 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 and all everybody complains about is, is be nicer. And I'm like, yeah, because it's hard to work with someone who's a jerk, right? I mean, it's just, it makes life tough. So I didn't say that. Uh, so what I said was something I know to be true, and I say this to, to every person that comes on our team. I said, look, there's the job that you were brought here to do, and then there's the reason that God brought you here. Okay, there's a job, and then there's the reason that God brought you here. God is way more concerned with what he is doing in you than what he's going to do through you. All right? He can get it done with or without you. He's intimately concerned about who you are and who you are becoming. And see, the problem is our culture, we define ourselves by what we do. Matter of fact, we want to be. You go to a, go to a, a party and you introduce, hey, how's it going? How's it going? What do you do? What do you do? I'm a fill in the blank. I am blank. I am teacher. We're actually talking about an existential statement. I am plumber. Captain Plumber. You know, I am lawyer. I am uh, insurance agent. I am. And we identify ourselves by what we do. And God is so much more concerned with who you are becoming so that you can become the person that he created you to be. It does involve gifts. It does involve circumstances. It does involve action. But it's really about who you are rather than something that you do. And the problem is we have bit, 
hook, line, and sinker on this in our culture and in our churches. Pray the magic prayer, then do. Do a life group. Do a mission trip. Do a check writing. Do a this, do a that. And if you do those things and you get on the treadmill of, of righteousness, then you become an intimate, passionate follower of Jesus? <laughs> How's that working for you? It's not. This confuses the heck out of people. Why? Because we're do-oriented. If you are going to embrace your calling, you've got to know who you are. If you're going to know who you are, who God designed you to be and become, then you have to have an intimate relationship with Jesus and pursue becoming, not pursue doing. As a man thinketh, so is he. In other words, if I think I am defined by what I do, then that's what I pursue. If I'm defined by my relationship with Jesus and becoming who he has designed me to be, that changes everything. In Luke chapter 10, verse 38, Jesus and his disciples, they're on their way, and he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. Jesus goes to Mary and Martha and Lazarus' home quite often there in Bethany. It was uh, not uncommon for him to stop there in his travels because it was a place of hospitality. It was a large home. Uh, his entire discipleship group could be accommodated there. In this day and age, being able to accommodate 12 men who are on the road, uh, that would have been a, a pretty significant uh, house that was used to uh, hosting. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. Mary and Martha are mentioned, Lazarus is mentioned, but no parental units. So likely, Martha's the oldest sister, Mary younger, and then Lazarus the youngest, and their parents have already deceased and left them this rather large uh, place. Doesn't mention that either of them are married, which would have been very uncommon. So they're women of means, unmarried, who are able to host large groups. Twelve guys show up. They're hungry. Beds need to be made, the whole nine. Mary is sitting at Jesus' feet, listening to what he had to say. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. You think? <laughs> right? I mean, just picture yourself. You're at your house. Twelve people you weren't expecting show up. They come when they come. They go when they go. They show up, and you're like, okay, it's on. Honey, and she's sitting over there at Jesus' feet. So Martha, who's distracted and overwhelmed by this, says, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Great question. Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha. You are worried, anxiety, fear, and upset about many things. It's not just that your sister's not helping, but anyway. A few things are needed. Actually, only one. She has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken from her. Who are you becoming? It's a great... Uh, insight here. Mary is sitting at the Lord's feet. First, I want you to see this, and it's most often missed. Sitting at the Lord's feet is an act of radical rebellion. Sitting at the Lord's feet is a revolution of turning over the customs of tradition and the expectations of society. We know from Paul's use of this phrase in Acts chapter 22 when he says, I sat at the feet of Gamaliel, that one sitting at a 
person's feet is an act of disciple to rabbi. The, a woman would sit at a man's feet to either wash his feet, to serve him, but never would a woman sit at a teacher's feet, a rabbi's feet as a disciple. Women weren't allowed to be disciples during this day. What Mary is doing and what Jesus is allowing is a radical overthrow of customs and traditions and social norms. And Martha is like, tell her to get in the kitchen where she belongs. She ain't got no business going to college, getting a degree, being discipled. We got stuff to do. Most people miss that in this text. What I want to tell you is this. Not only is that true still in our culture, male and female. It's true in our society. If you want to sit at the feet of Jesus, it takes a little bit of friction. You're going to have to say no to some things and yes to others. You're going to have to carve out time. It might make someone in your home upset. All of a sudden, you start waking up early so that you can have that hour with Jesus to grow and to know and to study. And They're not used to your alarm clock going off at 5, and they're like, really? It takes some, some change. I'm thinking about Laura leading worship this morning, and she prefaces that song by talking from her heart about what God has taught her in it, and she's leading you in worship and she's only been on our team a couple of weeks, and she asked me, is it okay if I speak? And I'm like, I don't see how you could do your job if you didn't. And she goes, well, at other places, I've been told, just play music. You're not allowed to talk. God has called you and gifted you, and if you're going to use your gifts and pursue your calling, sometimes it means you're going to rub up against some other people and it's going to cause some societal friction. Some people in their work, well, Pastor Jeff, in my workplace, you used that story about that guy in his workplace who did this in my workplace. I can't do that. I, I get all kinds of friction when I, when I try to live for Jesus in my workplace. Yeah. You mean I should get fired? No. But uh, you shouldn't be afraid to create some friction. To live for Christ, you don't have to do, break rules right there in your workplace, but you can still take someone to lunch, you can invite them over to dinner, you can still share, share, share Jesus with them. What I'm saying to you is this, most people don't know their calling because they're distracted by what they're doing and they haven't pursued Jesus enough to know what he has called them and invited them to be and to become and they're not willing to swim against the grain. I just mixed metaphors right there. But anyway, how many, I've, I've done every food fad known to man. A few years ago, I was a vegan. How many of you remember when I went through my vegan phase? I was militant vegan, by the way. I did it really well for a while. Um, but when I do something, I mean, I'm, I go for it. But when I was a vegan, my friends didn't like me. <laughs> I mean, when I started eating meat again, I had one of my friends call me and go, dude, I love you, but I like you so much more when you're eating meat. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it makes people uncomfortable. They don't want to invite you over. because, like, oh, well, I don't know, what do we do? Tofu? I don't know, what do you do with tofu? We're having steaks. What do we feed him? It's just weird. <laughs> it's the same thing. If I'm going to dedicate and devote and pursue Jesus... It creates some conflict. One of, my, one of my needs is solitude. Just as, as a human, the way a God wired me, I need time alone. As a matter of fact, uh, I was on sabbatic for three months several years ago, and one month I was by myself in the mountains, and they was like, did you get lonely? And I was like, no. Well, how much solitude time do you think? I don't know. I haven't found the limit yet. Right? Like, that's just a thing. And I, I, it's just, it's other people don't like that. When you're married and have four kids, it's actually really hard to get solitude. And it creates friction. You mean you're going to go away for the, 
when we first married, it would break Jody's heart that I could go away. And I, don't even need to, I don't even mean to have a phone call at night. Like, I'm good. It would just make her so hurt. And it wasn't that we've gotten in a better rhythm and I can call it more and thank God for texting and all that. But what I'm saying is um, it created friction because of our differences. But I needed time alone. And you have to produce 52 messages and, and, and you have to pour out certain things in my wiring and in my world just require that solitude. But, but it was hard to get. And I had to fight for it. Here's the thing. Most of you have no clue who God has called you to be because you are on the distraction treadmill of do. And the church feeds the do. The do. The, the do. Do. Do do. We feed it. We just crank it out. You need another Bible study? It's not bad. Bible studies are good. You need another class? It's not bad. Classes are good. But if you don't know who God made you to be and become, what you are called to pursue, then you're just filling up a class. Distracted. Busy. Second thing. Distracted by the stress of the ordinary. And here's the thing. Distractions don't come just in big ticket items. Distractions come in little minutia. Martha was distracted by all the preparations. Jesus says, you are worried, verse 41, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed. In fact, only one is needed. And Mary has chosen what is better. We said earlier, what you focus on is what you become. She's distracted. But this is a legitimate sense of injustice that she has, right? Like, I'm left here to do all the work. Jesus, tell her to help me. That's legit. Like, how many of us would not be, like, put off by someone who was supposed to be helping doing their thing, and they're not doing it? I mean, Martha's got a point. She takes, she, she takes a lot of heat, but, but I mean, she kind of gets a bad rap because this is legitimate. This is the struggle that all of us have. It's irresponsible. And we're, we're at the minimum impractical just to go, whatevs, I'm just going to hang out here with Jesus. I don't need to do any of that. That's not what he's saying. He's distinguishing between wants and needs and commending her for choosing the better. I learned this in a big way years ago. Before we started doing Leadership Summit, I would go to Chicago to go to Leadership Summit, and I got invited to go to the big kahuna's house, Bill Hybels. Um, and there was about me and 25 other pastors were going to be at his house, and I'm super excited. Like, he's royalty, he's famous, we're going to go to his house, it's going to be a big deal. All these other guys, they're pretty important people, and I get to go. So I go to this swanky, nice neighborhood, pull up. I'm going into his house, and when I get in his house, it's just, you know, 25 of us, and it's, I'm feeling pretty good, and I'm here. And, and then the, they take boxes of pizza, and they open them up, and there's paper plates on the end of the table. And he said, hey, I uh, learned a long time ago, it's not about the food. It's about the relationships. So grab a piece of pizza. When you're done, put it in the trash and uh, get to know the people around here. And I thought, that's amazing. He's focusing on what was actually needed. Yeah, we, he needed to feed people, but he just did it pragmatically because it's not about the food. He focused the main thing on the main thing is that the people in the room would have time to get to know one another, not distracted by which fork to use or, ooh, the lamb with the, the chutney, no, 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 so good. I mean, he didn't get messed up with all that stuff. 
And our problem is that we're focused and distracted on wants. 99% of what we spend our time on has to do with wants and not need. Because Jesus said there's only one thing needed. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus summarized it this way. He says, love one another. Barbara Bush said it this way. At the end of your life, I've never heard anyone say, oh, I wish I would have worked a little bit harder. I wish I would have spent some more time at work. But people always say, I wish I would have invested in my relationships. Why? Because it's all about relationship. Jesus says, Martha, only one thing is needed. Sit at my feet. Know who I've designed you to be and love others. In our culture, we have this disproportionate focus on what's missing. And so we focus on, well, I need to get this car and this house and this neighborhood and this degree and this job and this promotion. And I just need to swipe right and get this guy and I need to do whatever it is. We want to acquire and get and grasp. And all of those things are wants. And what Jesus is saying is sit at my feet. Do the radical thing. Do the unconventional thing. You've got to fight for it. But dwell with me and know who you are. Know your unique gifts. Know your unique attributes. Know that through you, I'm going to, to reach people that no one else could ever reach. And follow me. Come and follow me. But in order to do that, it's going to take a little bit. You're going to make some people unhappy, uncomfortable. She's worried and upset about many things. And what he says here is, but Mary has chosen what is better. And watch this. And it will not be taken away from her. The what is better won't be taken away. When you choose what is better, it will not. It can't be taken away. The only thing you're going to take with you from here to there our relationships. That's it. That's it. And what Jesus says is, is when you choose the what is better, to know me, to love me and to love others, to love me and to love others, to love me and to love others, to be my disciple, to sit at my feet, to follow me and express me to others. When you choose that, it cannot be taken away. He's not saying the things that we do are not important. He's not saying that uh, the laundry doesn't need to be done. Listen to me. When is the laundry done? Never! Unless you are naked. <laughs> it's never done. Listen to how we speak. Well, I've got to get, it's not done. It's never done. We think and do. And we think and do about things that can never be done. What if we changed our orientation and thought about who am I becoming? Am I becoming the type of person who has a bigger heart or a smaller heart? Am I becoming the type of person who cares deeply about the lost and the hurting and the marginalized, or I'm so numb to pain and grief and, and, and the news media cycle that I just am numbed out. Who am I becoming, God? Who have you designed me to be? And then pursue him by knowing who he made you to be. And that's not easy. We've gotten so focused about this recently because I am convinced that you cannot become a disciple and follower of Christ by doing the, the church shuffle. You've got to first discover who God made you, the masterpiece, the Ephesians 2.10 masterpiece that he made you to be, and then pursue your calling from there. It's not, we're, gonna, we're not going to stop doing Bible studies. We're not going to stop doing those things, but we're going to start helping people discover God made you exactly this way and he placed you exactly here. And so out of that, what do you believe God's calling for your life looks like? 
And as they begin to verbalize that and articulate that, then we're going to help them figure out, okay, how to pursue that. Just like the early church laid their hands on Paul and Silas because Paul had a distinct, clear calling upon his life to go to the Gentiles. So the early church said, go. And we'll send money and we'll send prayers and we'll send support. Go. And we're going to figure out your calling and we're going to equip you to pursue it. But until then, we just have a lot of inert potential that has not been released. I want you to begin asking, Holy Spirit of God, show me who you want me to become. Show me who you designed me to be. And as you discover your calling, I believe God will well up passion within you to pursue something that you never even dreamed possible. I believe that for every single believer in the room. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus, you don't have the presence of the Holy Spirit of God within you to dis help you discover what your gifts you can live a purposeful life, but you can't live the ultimate purpose for your life because you're not in relationship with the one that made you. The only way that you can do that is to be in right relationship with him, and he provided the way through Jesus, his son. Jesus paid the penalty to remove the barriers so that you could come into relationship with the Father, discover his reason for creating you, and live it. He says that the way that you enter into that relationship is by faith. If you're here and you've never placed your faith in Jesus, and faith is not an abstract concept, faith is physically giving your life to, sitting at his feet. There's a difference between mental cognition of knowing who Jesus is and then willful volition of saying, you're mine, you're my Lord, I will follow you, I give you my life. The faith that trusts is the faith that exchanges their life for the life of Christ. No longer you who live, but Christ lives within you. The way that you do that is you testify, God. And you can say this in your heart and in your mind as a prayer to him right now. God, my sin limits me, has prohibited me from being in relationship with you. I don't know who I am. I don't know my purpose. And I'll never know apart from you because of sin. And I repent, I recognize that the way I'm living is not the way that you want me to live. And so I give you my life and I place my faith, I place all of myself in the hands of your son, Jesus, who died for me. And I want to receive your spirit so that I can know my purpose and I can have a reason for living. And so Lord God, by faith, I trust you, I give you my life so that I can receive your life. And I will sit at your feet. I will commit to follow you. When you express that to God, God says, I'll give you my spirit. You're now my child. Come and follow me. If you're praying that in your heart, that sentiment is going on in your spirit, the spirit testifies to your spirit that you're a child of God. Some of you are here today and you say, Pastor, I've done that. I did that years ago, but I still have no idea what you're talking about as far as knowing some kind of distinct calling upon my life. Let me ask you this. If you're a follower of Christ, and you've been sitting here for the last half hour listening to the word of God proclaimed, and the spirit of God has nudged you with relation to knowing more clearly what your calling is, you're intrigued by it, you're convicted by it, you've been maybe aggravated by some of the ways I've said it, ask yourself, Right now, Lord, what is it that you want me to do about that? That thing that's going on in here, what do you want me to do about it? You want me to just walk out of here like another Sunday, get in the car? And what do you want me to do about that? This next year, we are going all in on helping people, whether you're 7 or 70, discover your unique calling. It's never too late. You can sign up for a class, go through a process, it's intense, but we want you to know who God made you to be, and then we want to deploy you to be that in the world.
If you're here today and you uh, exchanged your life or you prayed within your heart to give your life to Jesus, there's a card in the seat back in front of you. It's called a next step card. You can fill that out or after service you can come under each cross and there will be a prayer team here to receive you, to pray with you and help you take next steps. If you want to find out next steps about how to pursue your calling, fill out the next step card. We'll send you information about how to sign up for our unique uh, different things, accelerators, classes, all different types of ways and forms. We're going to be pushing it out so that there's no excuse. Everyone who wants to will have the opportunity to. It's not the only way you can discover your calling, but it is the most robust way that I've seen. And we're inviting people not to go to church, but as we say, we're inviting people to be the church based on a specific, clear calling from God upon their life. Once you get that, there's no holding you back. There's nothing that can stop you. When you believe God has called me to be this person and to live this out in this place, it's something so powerful that the distractions of this life won't get in the way. So, next step in front of you, under each cross, our prayer team. I'm going to pray, and then we're out, okay? Father, I thank you for each person in this room. There is no coincidence, Lord God, in you. People are in this room to hear the message from you, and what they do with it is up to them. And if your spirit is stirring, Lord, may they be obedient. May they be responsive. May they not quench you. May they take steps of action to discover the beautiful person that you made them to be and pursue becoming that. Lord, help them to know the fullness of knowing you. Help them to, to fight against culture, to put away the distractions, and to choose to sit at your feet and to be who you made them to be. Lord God, we are distracted by, by many wants. There's only one thing that is needed, and help us, Lord God, to choose it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. See you guys next week.